Yeah. Just go yeah. forward, right? Oh, there I am. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you. Um, there's a lot of people involved in this work and um, and a lot of people that have been involved in, in supporting it. Um, but what I want to walk you through is really how hard it is, what you have to do to sort of dig through one of these mechanisms that leads towards long COVID. It's not a trivial process. Um, so the paper Jason and uh, Helen both mentioned a couple of years ago that we published um, said that we could actually anticipate who was going to develop long COVID at the time or even before um, they were diagnosed with, with COVID-19. And before is because some patients type 2 diabetes was anticipatory, but um, very early on, one saw reactivation of EBV, um, SARS-CoV-2 levels in the blood, and autoantibodies. Um, now, the challenge with these is that those are crazy, they'd be great diagnostics if they lasted, but they don't last. They're very transient. And in fact, when um, uh, one of the you know, well-known people in this field, Akiko Ayazaka, we were still working to her to look at autoantibodies late in the, in the game. And she said, we don't see them. But all her patients were like at six months post-diagnosis. And if you look, here's patients' autoantibodies over a two-year period. They're there for about three months, and then they're gone. Okay? But we know autoantibodies, if you had them, early in the disease course, you're very likely to have long COVID months later. If you had them early in the disease course, your risk of dying from COVID-19 was higher. And so we wanted to track this down. And um, one hypothesis that we had that really came out of the lupus literature was that, um, is this a pointer? Okay. Um, uh, it, it, there's this Normally, what, what happens, you know, when B cells are the one, things that produce the antibodies. Um, and so when they get, um, you know, triggered by the signals from an infection, they'll migrate to germinal centers, which are in solid tissues, and mature with the help of T cells and other immune cells, and then start producing antibodies. But in lupus patients, and it turns out in almost everybody, it's just they were first seen in lupus patients, they were thought to be abnormal first, but now they're just less common. You can actually have B cells that will mature without all this help. They're called atypical memory B cells, and they will begin producing antibodies. And we saw in the patients that were producing autoantibodies that these cells were um, elevated. And, um, and so to study this, I say really challenging. These are rare cells. And so, and there's a lot of confounding factors that can influence such a study. So we selected for women, they have higher antibodies in general, and, and their risk of PASC is higher, uh, long COVID. Um, these were um, elderly women, but in particular, they were actually of a very narrow age range. And so two major confounding factors are just gone from the study, age and sex. Um, and we only... After out of 209 patients we started with, this gave us about a dozen patients. They had very similar levels of atypical memory B cells, these things that we suspect are bad culprits here, but, um, but very wide variations in autoantibodies. And so from these patients, we isolated on the order of 100,000 B cells. And in every single B cell, we measured um, how, where was the, the DNA exposed and what parts of the DNA could possibly be making genes and then which genes were actually being made, okay? And so this allows us, it gives us a pretty deep view on these B cells and allows us to ask, if you're making autoantibodies, if you're not, what's different about these B cells? And it turns out there's a lot of things different, and it explains why something like vaccination or molnupiravir is actually important in, in, in lowering the risk of long COVID. Number one is that you have elevated DNA, RNA, viral-like sensors in these, basically these, these B cells are being cranked up by, by signals. It could come from tissue damage, but probably coming from virus as well. And so getting rid of those virus signals early in the disease course or being vaccinated to keep them down is important. Um, second is that these cells, so these are the autoantibody levels. So these are the, the high patients are over on the left. Um, and these cells actually get cranked up in terms of secreting things. 
And on top of that, you can actually identify really fundamental transcription factors that are driving them. I'm not going to worry about too much what that means, but it says if you really wanted to dig into this data and find a drug target, you probably can. Um, so we actually took from these patients, we had a little bit of biospecimens left, and we matured all the different types of B cells into, if we could, into antibody-producing cells to see what happened. And it turns out these atypical memory B cells pretty much exclusively make autoantibodies. The regular B cells make both antibodies and autoantibodies. But overall, if you have a B cells that are making a lot of autoantibodies, your immune space is less. You're just making less antibodies. And so your ability to recover from that disease is actually slow. And um, and the fact that the you actually have B cells in the normal pathway that are making autoantibodies suggests that there might be a recall response here, that these patients may actually have had this before. It just didn't affect them so profoundly as it did here. We don't know that for sure. So what it tells you is that these B cells, it, they're actually supposed to be there. But they're and, and it's probably a normal response. They're having viral and other types of signatures that are cranking them up. They're just trying to make antibodies really quickly. And it's like, let's just make as many antibodies as we can and live and live to fight another day. Um, as a consequence, you make a lot of antibodies with lousy properties and they're 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 cross-reactive. And what that suggests is that it's not just these lupus autoantibodies that should be high in these patients, they should be making antibodies against the whole human proteome. And in fact, they are. And so here's these autoantibody high patients, and we measured the autoantibodies against this number of proteins, the anti-nuclear, anti-systolic, membrane, secrete, every single class of proteins you can do. They're all high in these patients. And so when you ask, how do you get so many different symptoms? How do you exacerbate all these maybe underlying symptoms to make them elevated is because a lot of these autoantibodies are going to be functional and they're going to be impacting your health going forward. So even though they may disappear quickly, like in three months, not really quickly and quickly, but they can have a lasting impact. And I think that that's probably what we're seeing um, in these patients. Now, this is not the only cause of long COVID, but it's a pretty big one. And and so, so you, you see these are you know, we're, we believe it's some sort of a survival response against SARS-CoV-2. And it's triggered by these viral tissue damage signatures that you can absolutely repress through things like vaccinations and, um, and antivirals early in the disease course. Antivirals late in the disease course, I don't think they're going to help that much. Um, autoantibodies have serious health consequences. We know they can impact the rate of mortality. And, um, and I know uh, Akiko has tried some of these autoantibodies in animal models, and they cause all sorts of interesting phenomena, so they're functional. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, some patients uh, exhibit evidence of this antibody recall response, suggesting that perhaps some patients just have a tendency to make these autoantibodies. And in fact, we actually have early evidence that autoantibody production may have underlying genetic factors. And we don't know... It's actually a pretty clear signal, and it's the same signal that you would say is a risk for uh, type 2 diabetes. But I'm guessing there's just overlap in those two types of polygenic scores. That is, they're not actually anticipating the same thing. Um, and with that, thank you. And I guess we now have the panel. We have the questions. <laughs>